Hi, I'm Dr. Tom Kravitz, Physician Executive for 3M Consulting Services. Thank you for joining me. Today we're going to talk about ICD-10 documentation for general surgery. There are some changes you will need to make in your documentation to support ICD-10, but there are instances of documentation that can remain the same. Let's get started. We'll help you dissect these changes. I know you are busy in your clinical practice, so I will briefly summarize the key takeaways. In your documentation of patient care, consider the use of adjectives. Link the cause and effect of each condition. Be specific about aspects of a disease and each anatomical site, and use exact dates when appropriate. A little more on each of these. Differentiate in your notes whether or not a condition is acute, chronic, or acute on chronic whenever appropriate. For example, write anemia due to acute blood loss instead of blood loss anemia. Use due to or secondary to to indicate cause and effect and to record all conditions the patient may have such as acute systolic heart failure due to or secondary to hypertension. Think about the most current terminology to describe a condition or different aspects of the disease. For example, acute respiratory failure with hypercapnia or hypoxia. Precisely designate anatomical site such as carcinoma in situ of lower outer quadrant of right breast. Identify the bacterial or viral organism causing a condition, if known or suspected, such as E. coli UTI. Ask yourself, what else could I add in my notes about this patient's condition that would better communicate how sick the patient is, which in turn better communicates the resources needed for patient care? Incorporating these aspects into your documentation will result in an accurate picture of your patient's severity of illness and risk of mortality. This in turn will result in accurate public reporting on quality and outcomes. And it will help reduce the number of queries you receive to clarify your documentation. In the upcoming slides, we'll take a look at some diseases and procedures that have new documentation requirements under ICD-10. In ICD-10, there is a feature called laterality for right, left, and bilateral, which is found in many diagnoses and procedure codes involving paired organs or those codes specific to one side of the body versus the other. For example, acute left otitis media. ICD-9 has a limited number of these. ICD-10 has many more. This feature of ICD-10 by itself is responsible for a substantial increase in the number of codes which you have probably heard so much about. Since you usually include this information in your patient care notes, additional documentation will typically not be needed. So for your information, if you happen to omit laterality when needed, it may result in a query. Suffice it to say, Laterality is included when appropriate for some conditions you may treat. For example, pressure ulcer of the left ankle. So do a quick double check of your notes to be sure you included it before signing off. We'll try not to belabor this point in the upcoming slides. ICD-10 provides new combination codes to differentiate severe sepsis with or without septic shock. It is important to document septic shock when present in addition to the underlying infection when known and any associated organ dysfunction such as acute respiratory failure, acute renal failure, acute hepatic failure and or disseminated intravascular coagulopathy.
Acute organ dysfunction is an important predictor of severity of illness and risk of mortality in the critically ill patient. Should you treat a patient with SIRS due to a non-infectious process such as trauma, be sure to document this. Documentation of any associated acute organ dysfunction for this patient is also important. Sometimes we use the terms bacteremia, sepsis or septicemia, and severe sepsis interchangeably or indiscriminately in records when in fact these terms are different diagnoses resulting in different codes. Bacteremia describes the presence of bacteria in the blood without symptoms. Sepsis and septicemia describe the patient with symptoms but without associated organ dysfunction. Severe sepsis describes the patient with associated organ dysfunction. Make certain you clearly document the term that accurately describes your patient's condition. This ensures correct reporting of the complexity of your patient's condition. What is new with urinary tract infections is that the diagnosis of urosepsis can no longer be coded in ICD-10. In ICD-9, a diagnosis of urosepsis defaulted to the code for an unspecified urinary tract infection. If you record a diagnosis of urosepsis in the ICD-10 environment, it will generate a query asking you for clarification. If by using the term urosepsis, you mean the patient has a UTI, then document UTI. If you mean the patient has septicemia from a urinary source, make sure to document this. For example, E. coli sepsis due to UTI. ICD-10 terminology describing congestive heart failure remains essentially unchanged from ICD-9. However, there is currently an opportunity for improvement in documenting this diagnosis. To provide an accurate picture of the patient's severity of illness and risk of mortality, you should specify whether the patient's congestive heart failure is acute, chronic, acute, on chronic, and whether it is systolic, diastolic, or a combination of both. Additionally, you should document the cause or etiology of the congestive heart failure when known or suspected. An example of excellent documentation would be acute systolic heart failure due to possible or suspected alcoholic cardiomyopathy. ICD-9 provided a single code for cardiac arrest. ICD-10 provides the ability to report the cause of the cardiac arrest when known or suspected as due to an underlying cardiac condition or other condition. Your documentation should indicate a cause and effect relationship by using words such as due to or secondary to. ICD-9 did not differentiate between a diagnosis of respiratory failure and acute respiratory failure. The good news is that ICD-10 does. When appropriate, you should document respiratory failure as acute, chronic, or acute on chronic. Additionally, also specify if hypoxia or hypercapnia, or both, is associated with the respiratory failure. Remember, coders cannot interpret the results of tests such as arterial blood gases. They must rely on your documentation. At times, we see respiratory insufficiency and respiratory distress used interchangeably with respiratory failure. Respiratory insufficiency and distress are signs and symptoms of an underlying condition and are coded differently from respiratory failure in ICD-10. Be clear on your intended diagnosis. Severity of illness will not be reported accurately if you use one term when you meet another. Additionally, document the cause or etiology 
of respiratory failure, such as due to COPD, surgery, or trauma. When pulmonary insufficiency is due to surgery, documentation should describe a cause and effect relationship, and it should be further described as acute or chronic. For example, acute pulmonary insufficiency due to surgery two days ago. FYI, one of the differences in ICD-10 is that pulmonary insufficiency due to surgery will be classified as either due to thoracic or non-thoracic surgery. What's new here? ICD-10 has a new combination code to capture the patient who has a pulmonary embolism with acute core pulmonality. The takeaway here is the documentation of core pulmonality and whether it is acute or chronic. What stays the same is that you still need to document the type of pulmonary embolism, such as septic or saddle, and whether the pulmonary embolism is acute, chronic, or healed or old. History of PE can be interpreted to mean the patient has had the condition for a while, such as in history of hypertension, or interpreted to mean the patient no longer has the condition. Documentation of chronic pulmonary embolism versus healed or old PE makes a clear distinction and assures that the severity of illness of your patient is reported accurately. Severity of illness is increased when a patient has a chronic pulmonary embolism, but there is no impact on the severity of illness when the patient has a personal history of pulmonary embolism. Note that documentation of healed or old PE results in the reporting of a code for personal history of pulmonary embolism. The look and feel for codes describing diabetes have changed, but the level of detail describing the disease remains mostly the same. Therefore, your documentation doesn't need to change as long as you are currently documenting the type of diabetes as type 1 or type 2 and any associated complications. For example, diabetic peripheral angiopathy, diabetic autonomic neuropathy, or diabetic foot ulcer. The good news is that ICD-10 uses single combination codes to describe the disease. ICD-9 usually required multiple codes. Take, for example, the diagnosis of type 2 diabetes with diabetic peripheral angiopathy with gangrene. This diagnosis required three codes in ICD-9, but in ICD-10, one code reports everything. An additional code is assigned when you describe the patient's diabetes as poorly controlled or out of control. There's nothing new with blood loss anemia in ICD-10. It is still classified as anemia due to acute or chronic blood loss. There is, however, an opportunity for improvement in documenting this diagnosis. If the anemia is due to blood loss, you need to be certain you indicate the cause and effect in your documentation. Classification of asthma is an example of the use of updated terminology in ICD-10. Asthma is now classified as mild intermittent or mild, moderate or severe persistent. Documentation of acuity remains unchanged from ICD-9 you should continue to document the presence of an acute exacerbation or status asthmaticus. For example, a diagnosis of severe persistent asthma with acute exacerbation is classified to J45.51. ICD-10 differentiates COPD with acute lower respiratory tract infection from acute exacerbation of COPD without infection. When an infection is present, document the specific infection and organism 
when known or suspected. When respiratory failure is present, it should be specified as acute, acute on chronic, or chronic. Dependence on supplemental oxygen should also be indicated when applicable. Most types of emphysema were grouped into a single ICD-9 code. What's new in ICD-10? Separate codes are provided for specific types of emphysema. When you document the specific type of emphysema, such as unilateral, panlobular, or centrolobular, a unique ICD-10 code for that condition can be reported. ICD-10 has greater specificity for anatomical site and usually requires documentation of laterality for paired organs. Be sure your documentation is as specific as possible when identifying anatomic site. Unchanged from ICD-9 is the classification of malignancies as primary or secondary, which is a particularly problematic area of documentation for coders. Often, primary or secondary is not specified, and in the case of secondary malignancies, whether the primary site is still present. A statement of history of can be ambiguous and may prompt a query. For example, appropriate documentation of a lung malignancy would be metastatic cancer to left upper lobe of lung from left breast. Patient had left mastectomy one year ago. This documentation clearly identifies the primary and secondary sites and states the primary site is no longer present, all of which are factors considered in code assignment. What's new here is that a diagnosis of depression without further qualification is coded to F32.9 in ICD-10, which is the code for major depressive disorder, single episode, unspecified. In ICD-9, a diagnosis of unqualified depression was assigned a code that simply said depression. If major depression is not your intended diagnosis, consider adding additional details to your documentation when known. It will change the code and better describe what you are treating. For example, major depression could be further specified as single episode or recurrent. In either case, is it mild, moderate, or severe? If severe, it is with or without psychotic features. Is your intended diagnosis something else other than major depression, such as adjustment disorder, for example, grief reaction, with depression and or anxiety, anxiety depression, or depressive neuroses? According to published Medicare inpatient hospital data, the code for unspecified depression appears on one-fifth of hospital records covered by Medicare. We can do a better job identifying patients with major depressive disorders as compared to those with other forms of depression that are less severe and require less resources. Malnutrition is an underdocumented condition in the elderly. However, it is also an important indicator of your patient's severity of illness and an important influence on performance metrics such as readmission rates, length of stay, and quality outcomes. If your patient has malnutrition, you should document the clinical picture, the type, such as protein calorie or protein energy malnutrition, and the stage or degree, for example, mild, moderate, or severe, or first, second, and third degree. Your notes should include clinical findings such as patient with terminal cancer, 20 pound weight loss and cachexia, and any supporting labs such as low albumin. Given the health risks of obesity and the number of obese people, it is important for us to be able to continue to track the prevalence and cause of obesity. So consider incorporating nutritional obesity into your vocabulary when applicable.
It's a few less words than obesity due to excess calories. If your patient has morbid obesity, also document if alveolar hypoventilation is present. ICD-10 has a single combination code for it. As in ICD-9, ICD-10 continues to classify obesity due to other causes such as due to drugs or endocrine disorders. In ICD-9, codes for complications did not identify when the complication occurred, the body system affected, or type of surgery performed. ICD-10 codes do. In order to code a complication, the coder must know whether the complication occurred intraoperatively or postoperatively, so include these details in your notes when it is not readily apparent. Additional elements needed for code assignment, which the coder should be able to determine from the record are body system of organ affected and body system on which the procedure was performed. For example, patient underwent a colon resection and subsequently experienced a post-operative hemorrhage in the recovery room due to an accidental puncture of a small artery. As seen here, two codes will be assigned for these circumstances. ICD-9 provided a single code for tobacco abuse and dependence without differentiation and without further specificity for the type of tobacco product. ICD-10 provides separate codes for these. If your intended diagnosis is dependence, dependence is what you should document rather than abuse. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, most smokers are dependent and nicotine dependence is the most common form of dependence in the U.S. Additionally, further specificity is provided in ICD-10 for the type of tobacco product dependence as cigarettes, chewing tobacco, or other, for example, cigars. So this should be documented as well. Your documentation should differentiate between current abuse or dependence versus a person who no longer uses tobacco. Starting in 2002, the number of former smokers has exceeded the number of current smokers. For tobacco dependence, ICD-10 provides the ability to report remission and withdrawal. Examples of nicotine withdrawal symptoms include irritability, anxiety, difficulty concentrating, and increased appetite. ICD-10 also provides the ability to show a cause and effect relationship between tobacco dependence and nicotine-induced disorders when documented. Finally, your notes for a patient's exposure to secondhand smoke can be converted to an ICD-10 code that says exactly that. As physicians are increasingly held accountable for patient outcomes. A huge concern is how to classify the patient who fails to follow a recommended regimen of care and gets sicker as a result. Under ICD-9, there is only one generic code for such a patient that says non-compliance and no additional detail as to why the patient didn't follow your instructions. But in ICD-10, there are several codes to describe why a patient is non-compliant in taking drugs prescribed by you. This new clinical terminology is drug underdosing. Underdosing identifies situation in which your patient has taken less of a medication than prescribed by you, either unintentionally or intentionally. Document in your notes why the patient isn't taking the correct amount of their medication and the associated condition. For example, patient with history of recent GI bleed was found to have unimproved hemoglobin level after one month of taking prescribed iron. Upon questioning, patient admitted that she stopped taking the iron because it caused stomach pain and constipation. Or 
patient stopped taking her antibiotics because she cannot afford the medication. Now we'll take a look at several procedures that may be performed by you to give you some exposure to ICD-10 PCS codes and associated documentation requirements. ICD-10 PCS has specific definitions for these two different procedures. A code for excision is used only when a portion or part of an organ or body part is taken. Resection is taking all of a body part. This can be particularly problematic for the coder when your documentation is not precise or ambiguous. For example, the surgical removal of lymph nodes. Resection is assigned when an entire lymphatic chain is removed. Excision is assigned when several lymph nodes are removed, but not the entire chain. So document precisely what or how much of an organ or body part is removed. You don't have to use the words excision and resection according to coding definitions. The coder will apply the definitions based on your documentation of what and how much was surgically removed. Take, for example, open resection of an intramuscular lipoma of the right bicep. Although the physician documented resection, the coder will assign a code for excision since only a portion of the body part is removed. Here you see the table the coder will use to construct the code for this procedure. The first three digits of the code come from here, indicating an excision procedure of the muscles. The next digit of the code captures the specific body part, in this case, right upper arm muscle. The approach of open shows the procedure was performed through an incision. No device indicates a device was not left in the body, as would be the case, for example, of a PEG tube insertion. Finally, without a statement by you of biopsy or indication the procedure was performed for diagnostic purposes, the coder will select Z, no qualifier. The resulting code generated by the coder based on your documentation is 0KB70ZZ. Excisional and non-excisional debridements are coded differently. Your documentation should clearly state either excisional or non-excisional. Excisional debridement involves surgical removal or cutting away of tissue. This is different from a procedure that is non-excisional or mechanical debridement and which may simply involve brushing, scrubbing, and or washing. In the case of an excisional debridement, your documentation should state the depth of the debridement or the deepest point from which the tissue was debrided. Was your procedure limited to the skin only or was subcutaneous tissue also debrided? A single code is assigned based on the deepest layer debrided. Each tissue layer results in a different code. Take, for example, this abbreviated operative report. The physician did an excellent job documenting an excisional debridement, but there is contradiction in the documentation of the depth of the debridement. In the procedure description, the physician states excisional debridement was carried down to the muscle. However, the findings and technique do not support debridement of muscle. Only debridement down to the fascia is documented. Because debridement of fascia results in one code and debridement of muscle results in another, and only one code can be assigned, the coder must query the physician for clarification. Lysis of adhesions is a common procedure. Sometimes 
Operative reports do not precisely describe each organ or body part released. For ICD-9 coding purposes, this didn't matter because a single code was assigned regardless of the body part released. For ICD-10, you should document each and every organ or body part released because separate codes will be assigned for each. Take, for example, laparoscopic license of adhesions of the greater omentum, mesentery, and peritoneum. Three codes will be assigned. As described previously, the first three digits, 0DN, identify the procedure as a release procedure performed on the gastrointestinal system. The fourth digits of S, V, and W identify the anatomic sites. The fifth digit identifies the operative approach as percutaneous endoscopic, and the last two digits describe special circumstances such as any device left in the body or if the procedure is considered diagnostic. The assignment of a code for each organ or body part released will help explain the complexity of the procedure you performed. ICD-10 requires more detailed descriptions in your documentation of anatomical site and aspects of a disease, condition, procedure, and circumstances of patient encounters. The information generated from ICD-10 codes will result in a more accurate picture of your patients, their severity of illness, risk of mortality, and the services rendered. This in turn will result in accurate public reporting on quality and outcomes. Should you have questions about documentation for a particular diagnosis or procedure, your hospital's clinical documentation improvement specialist should be your first stop. The coding staff in your health information management department is a valuable resource as well. Thanks for joining me and have a great day.